27 July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should, I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold, but still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3 August. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6 August. Another three days and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a gray day, and the sun, as I write, is hidden in thick clouds high over kettleness. Everything is gray except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Gray earthy rock, gray clouds tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the gray sea, into which the sand points stretch like gray fingers. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mist drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a gray mist. All is vastness, the clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbor, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully, so he said, leaving his hand in mine. I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and such like for weeks past, but I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I'm gone. We odd folks that be daffled and with one foot abaft the crook hole don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scarred of it, and that's why I've took to make a light of it, so that I cheer up my own heart a bit. But Lord love you, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit. Only, I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I be odd, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect. And I'm so nigh it that the odd man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin' about it all at once. The chaffs will wag as they be used to. Some day soon, the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't you dole and greet, my dearie. For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something else than what we're doing. 
and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's coming to me, my dearie, and coming quick. It may be coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in that window over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck, and sore distress, and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There's a something in that wind, and in that host beyond the sounds, and looks, and tastes, and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me and blessed me and said goodbye and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me as he always does but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put it in here. Look there again. She has steered mightily strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow.